Why do you seem so scared? All I wanted to do was play with you. As a Forest Service employee, I had spent countless hours in the wilderness. Anyhow, this happened at Music Creek, southeast of Estacada, Oregon. It was late, and darkness had settled over the landscape like a heavy shroud. I was driving along the winding road, my headlights cutting through the gloom, casting in glow on the surrounding trees. The stillness of the night was broken only by the hum of my engine, and then it happened. In the fleeting moment that my headlights illuminated the road ahead, I saw it a massive figure darting across the asphalt. Its size alone was enough to send chills down my spine. Towering at a staggering seven to eight feet tall, it was a dark silhouette against the night, moving with an astonishing speed down the slope. My heart raced, and a surge of adrenaline flooded my veins. What had I just seen? Could it be possible? In that split second, my mind grappled with the unimaginable. Was this a Bigfoot? The stories that had circulated throughout the region suddenly took on a new meaning. I had always regarded them as mere folklore, stories passed down through generations. But now, confronted with this inexplicable sight, I couldn't deny the possibility that these held some grain of truth. I brought my car to a screeching halt, my hands gripping the steering wheel tightly. My gaze remained fixed on the spot where the creature had disappeared into the darkness. Fear mingled with curiosity, and a wave of trepidation washed over me. Should I investigate further? Should I pursue this enigma that had crossed my path? Part of me longed for answers, a desire to unravel the mysteries that lay hidden within the depths of these woods. But another part, a voice of caution, urged me to retreat. The unknown can be a dangerous realm, and venturing further into its clutches might invite consequences beyond my comprehension. Reluctantly, I made the decision to drive away, leaving the shadowy figure behind. At the time that this incident occurred, I was homeless and got around on an old bicycle. One evening, I was looking for a spot to set up a quick campsite in a small patch of woods along a public bicycle path in west-central Dark County, Ohio. I was cold and eager to get a small fire started and get into my sleeping bag. The area is a refuge for stray cats. Many locals drop off their unwanted or stray cats in this area, and some local kind-hearted folks feed them and provide plastic containers for shelter. When I found what I thought would be a suitable spot to set up camp, I set my bag down and walked a few steps to a large tree to empty my bladder. I had a small flashlight in my bag but the night sky provided enough light after my eyes were adjusted. Suddenly, a cat dashed through the brush very near me and startling me, then another further to left. As I looked toward the sound of the last cat running, I could make out the shape of the plastic containers in a small circle. These containers housed some cats. I then noticed three sets of pinkish-orange glowing objects with slight movement. I first assumed the glowing objects were the reflection of three cats' eyes. After watching the objects further approximately thirty seconds, I saw that the glowing was in fact some sort of eyewear worn by three human-like figures. As I knelt down to watch, I could see these figures were handling the cats, and the subjects were wearing very low reflective-off white or grey coveralls. After about two minutes, all three subjects turned their heads toward me. Thinking they might be animal control workers, and not wanting to frighten them, I stood up and asked, How are you doing? With no vocal response, all three began moving towards me, instantly closing the thirty feet that separated us. Slowly again, I asked, What are you guys doing out here? They continued moving towards me. I heard them talking or communicating, but inside my head, and in a strange whisper. I couldn't understand. I also noticed they were shorter than me. I'm five foot ten, and guessed they were ten to twelve foot shorter than me. I turned, got on my bicycle, and pedaled out of there. After several minutes of fast riding, I noticed no vehicles or signs of activity. It was almost like I entered a time warp. I didn't notice anyone or anything following me. I eventually found my way out of the area, but I was disoriented for many hours. 
I didn't sleep that night and continued riding west until I couldn't continue. I finally stopped and slept a few hours in a small park. I have no idea who those figures in the coveralls were, but I don't believe that they were human. The usually peaceful Amish neighborhood had been transformed into a hotbed of tense excitement and fear, all centered around a little white church standing serenely on the prairie. The Amish farmers and their families, known for their sedate and staid ways, were now gripped by curiosity and anxiety. The cause of their disquiet was a real live ghost that had taken a liking to haunting the immediate vicinity of the church. Rumors of the playful and ethereal apparition spread like wildfire among the villagers. Stout-hearted men, unafraid of fear, claimed to have seen it describing a four-foot-tall figure with broad and squat proportions, long arms, and unnaturally large black eyes. The ghost's first appearance had been witnessed by a young man from Clarion, who encountered it one night after returning home from spending time with his sweetheart. He shared his eerie experience with the villagers, but despite many keeping a watchful eye, the ghost remained elusive. Determined to debunk the stories and prove their bravery, four young men armed themselves with courage and muscle and set out to investigate the haunted church. As they circled the building and its surroundings, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and they began to doubt the tales. However, as they passed the church again, they were startled to find what seemed like a shadow crouching on the steps. The strange figure beckoned them with its eerie hands, inviting them to follow. Attempting to confront the ghost, they aimed their weapons, but it vanished every time they looked directly at it. Fear gripped them, their hair stood on end, and their bodies were drenched in sweat. The ghost seemed to taunt them, appearing on the church roof, its arms outstretched in a chilling gesture. Overwhelmed and frightened, they decided to retreat from the haunted place no longer doubting the existence of the apparition. Their harrowing encounters spread like wildfire, and many ridiculed them, dismissing the ghost as a mere figment of their imagination. But the four young men stood firm, adamant that they had seen and felt the ghost's eerie presence. Since that fateful night, the bravest and most reckless among the villagers kept a vigilant watch, determined to solve the mystery of the ghost. Despite the scoffs and laughter from some, the four witnesses remained steadfast in their claim, convinced that they had encountered something otherworldly that defied explanation. The little white church on the prairie became a beacon of curiosity and trepidation, attracting both the daring and the doubtful. The mystery of the playful ghost continued to linger in the hearts of the villagers, leaving them to wonder what lay beyond the realm of their understanding and experience. And so, the neighborhood remained wrapped in tension and anticipation, with each night bringing a fresh wave of brave souls, hoping to unlock the secrets of the enigmatic spirit that called the church its home. In my senior year of high school, a small group of like six of us decided to go camping one night. But none of us told our parents or anyone else what we were doing or where we were going. We ended up going to this campground but all the sites were taken so we drove really far out, to the point where we no longer saw campsites and we reached the end of the road. We found a small clearing that would fit our two cars and huge tent. It was already pitch black when we got there, so we couldn't see anything and set up a fire. We cooked some food, sat up telling stories, and eventually set up the big eight-person tent to sleep. We had heard a pack of coyotes, and I swear I heard a panther, though my group didn't hear it so I was already pretty spooked, not to mention my crippling anxiety, but managed to fall asleep, feeling somewhat safe with the six of us in the tent. Now, I'm an extremely light sleeper and wake up to even the slightest sound. Every crunch and rustle woke me up, but what woke me around one in the morning really scared the shit out of me. Something was sniffing at my head from the outside of the tent. I immediately started crying and woke up my friend next to me. When the sniffing stopped, telling her what had happened, she tried brushing it off until it had sniffed us again, this time closer to her head. Whatever it was began circling our tent then. I legitimately thought I was doing to die that night. We woke up everyone else, and there we were, 
huddled together, scared, shirtless, waiting for whatever it was to go away. Eventually, after circling our tent many times and continued sniffing it left, it was the worst sleep I've ever gotten. When we woke up that morning, we left right away, but not before seeing the big sign that said Bear Sanctuary in our small clearing. It could have been a dog, but it kept circling our tent and sounded big, and along with the Bear Sanctuary and supposed panther hearing, I doubt it was just a dog. I never expected my solo hunting trip in the secluded forests of Arizona to take such a terrifying turn. The idea was to hunt wild deer. But little did I know that I'd end up facing an unknown creature that seemed like something out of a nightmare. Venturing deep into the woods, I followed the path that led me further away from sunlight. The forest became dense, and shadows enveloped everything around me. My instincts told me to turn back but my determination pushed me forward. As I pressed on, my senses heightened, and I caught a glimpse of movement in the distance. My heart pounded in my chest as I focused my gaze. My eyes widened in disbelief and fear as I saw what I can only describe as a monstrous entity. It stood upright on its two hind legs, and its thin, emaciated frame sent chills down my spine. Its arms were disproportionately long, almost touching the ground, resembling a gorilla trying to conceal its true height. The creature's eerie gaze locked onto mine, and I could see its crooked spine and deformed face without any horns. Instead, it had neck hair that resembled a fake mane, and its skin appeared moonlight gray, reflecting an unsettling shine in its eyes. I instinctively raised my rifle, my hands trembling as I aimed at the grotesque figure. The adrenaline coursing through my veins was the only thing keeping me steady. With a deep breath, I pulled the trigger, the gunshot echoing through the forest. But to my shock and horror, the creature sensed the danger and managed to dodge the bullet with unnatural speed and agility. Before I could react, the creature rushed towards me with incredible force. It tackled me to the ground, and I felt an excruciating pain in my side as I hit a protruding rock, struggling to get back on my feet. I watched helplessly as the creature disappeared into the dark depths of the forest. Injured and shaken, I managed to pull out my phone and call for help. The park rangers came to my rescue, finding me battered and bewildered. They asked what had attacked me, and without hesitation, I described the chilling encounter in detail. The rangers exchanged skeptical glances, and I could sense that they didn't believe me entirely. They knew these woods like the back of their hands, and had never come across any creature fitting my description. Perhaps they thought my injuries had clouded my judgment, or that I had seen a bear or some other wildlife. Regardless, they patched me up and took me back to safety. My mind kept replaying the horrifying image of that creature. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this mysterious encounter than anyone was willing to accept. Four years ago, an unforgettable hunting trip took place, etched in my memory like a vivid painting. I was accompanied by my trusted companions, Uncle Jack, my brother Larry, and Frankie of Warm Springs. May he rest in peace. The season was perfect for elk hunting, with October-November casting a beautiful blend of colors over the landscape. Our destination was the wilderness near Mount Hood, a realm of nature's untamed majesty, we ventured off the beaten path, leaving the main road behind at the Bear Springs Ranger Station, and journeyed across the rugged ridges toward the McQuinn Strip, an addition of the warm Springs Reservation. As we trekked through the dense forests and embraced the solitude of the wild, little did we know that an awe-inspiring and terrifying encounter awaited us. In the distance, around 800 yards away, we spotted an astonishing sight two big feet in a meadow, our hearts pounded with both amazement and trepidation. The massive creatures had apparently taken down an elk and were feasting on its flesh, tearing off chunks with ease. It was a sight that defied belief mythical beings, as real as the wilderness surrounding us. As we watched through our rifle scopes, captivated by the scene unfolding before our eyes, another Bigfoot emerged from the brush to join the group. Moments later, 
a fourth one appeared, smaller in stature, but still an impressive five feet in height. The big feet ranged from seven feet tall to the smaller one at five feet, their presence alone enough to send shivers down our spines. While we were in awe of these magnificent creatures, our primal instincts kicked in, and we felt a growing concern for our own safety. If these majestic beings could so effortlessly take down an elk, could we be their next target? The idea of being on their menu for dessert was enough to send a chill down our spines, and with that realization, we chose to retreat. As we made our way back, Uncle Jack shared a story that added to the sense of awe and fear surrounding these mysterious beings. He recounted how a friend had witnessed Big Feet herding deer for the kill, illustrating their intelligence and cunning in securing a high-protein diet that sustained their impressive size, strength, agility, and speed. Our minds were swirling with questions and emotions as we hiked out of the wilderness. The encounter had left us both amazed and terrified, forever altering our perception of the untamed world around us. We had been privileged to glimpse these elusive giants of the forest, and yet, the lingering fear of what they were capable of haunted our thoughts. Since that fateful day, we continued our hunting trips, but the memory of the Big Feet remained etched in our minds, a constant reminder that the wild had secrets beyond our understanding. I was in the Marine Corps for about six years. When I got out, I worked for several different companies with the government. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I was not emotionally or financially stable enough to re-enter the civilian world. So after talking to somebody in the Department of Defense, I took a job at this particular base. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I knew it would be better than jumping out of a plane or simply blowing things up. I had heard rumors about strange bases and all kinds of top secret projects over the years, but I never saw any proof of their existence until I began working on this particular base. It was a hot base, meaning that we had active duty personnel as well as contractors working there. The first couple of months were all pretty uneventful, except for the fact that my security clearance kept getting higher and higher. I was working in a very small office with only six desks in the room with five other people. I was the low man on the totem pole, so I got stuck in the back room with no windows. The walls must have been soundproofed with foam. Whenever somebody slammed a file cabinet door or dropped something on their desk, it sounded like a bomb going off. One day, my boss told me to follow him, and he took me down a series of hallways until we got to a special room. Inside this room were shelves and shelves of computers and what looked like either contraptions made out of metal or other materials. He informed me that these were real alien artifacts from a crash site located in Roswell, New Mexico. These were replicas from the late 1940s, and they looked pretty new. I have no idea how they made these or got these, but they also had several other replicas and models of other devices built by engineers who had studied them. I kept asking my boss questions about these artifacts, but he kept brushing me off and would tell me to focus on the work. I couldn't stop thinking about them, so I tried to do some digging on my own. It was not very long before I started finding my own things. We had several different projects going on, and everybody worked in a cubicle with a desk, a chair, and a computer. On the opposite wall of the room were several bulletin boards with different memos, white papers, and reminders. I was at my desk one day looking for a copy of an email when I noticed that there were several memos up there top secret ones, and they did not have the clearance level next to them. It was the titles of these memos that struck me as odd, so I decided to print them off and take them back to my desk. I will list the titles. I have no idea what they mean. Project Grudge, Operation Blue Fly, Magic 12. The project names intrigued me, so I printed them off and took them back to my desk. I opened up Google and typed in Project Grudge and Operation Blue Fly. The only thing that came up were people asking what these projects were, and conspiracy theorists saying they were watching them. To make a long story short, I spent hours and hours looking through various government documents, especially anything that had to do with projects related to aliens. My curiosity was driving me crazy. 
To say that I got to talking to it was a bit of an understatement. Shortly after, I was monitored, and I had a talking to for observing and looking over these documents. I was actually transferred to a base across the country with all my clearance redacted. I was told the entire reason I was transferred was due to a bad attitude and not complying with my job. Of course, that was on paper, but the real reason was because they were investigating me. They wanted to know what I had found and who I was talking about. What started out as a favor to one of my best friends ended with me being transferred to another state, having to start all over again. Fortunately, I kept copies of everything I'd found, all the documents. About two months after my arrival at the new base, three weeks before I was about to be rotated out of the service, I was called into an interrogation room. I was grilled for about three hours by someone from my old base. I was told that I could not speak of anything I had seen, read, or heard. They also made me sign several non-disclosure agreements and federal documents. My life was threatened if I ever planned on leaking any of this information. I guess we'll see what happens. Now, I'm going to go by the name of John Doe for this email. The short of it is this. Don't talk to anybody about anything you see, read, or hear at your job if it is not given to you on a silver platter. Government and military jobs are very dangerous for your mental health. Believe me. I don't know what they do to people who talk about the things they know. But I do know what they told me, and I'm going to have to be very careful. My name is Alex, and I used to be a part of one of the most elite Navy SEAL teams. We were known for our unwavering loyalty, dedication, and commitment to serving our country. But something changed, and it shook us to our core. A rogue group of ex-Navy SEALs, disillusioned and bitter, broke away from the path of honor and duty. They formed a deadly mercenary organization, calling themselves Valkyrie, and they embraced a life of selling their lethal skills to the highest bidder. The very idea of our former brothers-in-arms becoming enemies of the state left a bitter taste in our mouths. Their actions were brazen and reckless. Valkyrie embarked on a spree of high-profile heists, disrupting peace and threatening global stability. Their targets were high-value assets, and each successful operation fueled their dangerous reputation. As the chaos escalated, our government was left with no choice but to deploy an elite counter-terrorist team, which included me and some of my former comrades, to confront the rogue SEALs. The mission was personal for us, as we felt responsible for bringing our wayward brothers back from the brink. The game of cat and mouse between our teams unfolded across continents, with Valkyrie striking with ruthless precision and disappearing into the shadows. The line between friend and foe blurred as we hunted those we once trusted with our lives. Emotions ran high, and loyalties were tested at every turn. With each encounter, it became evident that our former teammates had truly turned into adversaries. Their hearts had grown cold, and their actions proved that they were willing to sacrifice anything for their twisted cause. In Yemen, we received intel that Valkyrie's enigmatic leader, known only as Black Eye, was holed up in a heavily fortified compound. The tension was palpable as we prepared for the final confrontation, knowing that this would be the moment of truth. The compound was a maze of danger, and we moved with utmost caution, aware that any misstep could lead to disaster. The familiar scent of gunpowder filled the air as the sounds of gunfire echoed through the corridors. The faceless enemy we once called our own, now adorned with a Valkyrie insignia, confronted us with relentless fury. It was a battle of wills, skill, and determination. The stakes were high, and we knew that failure was not an option. In the heart of that compound, amidst the chaos of the firefight, I found myself face to face with Black Eye. His eyes were cold and devoid of any semblance of the person I once knew. It was a painful reminder of how far he had fallen. The seconds felt like an eternity as we locked eyes, and then it happened. I pulled the trigger, and Black Eye fell, his lifeless body crumpling to the ground. It was a moment of closure, but it also brought with it a heavy burden of regret. The explosive showdown in Yemen marked the end of Valkyrie's reign of terror. 
but it also left scars on our souls. Our hearts were heavy as we returned home, knowing that we had lost brothers on both sides of the battlefield. Truck driver in the U.S. I had just started trucking and had been at it a few months. I was with a company that makes you ride teams for the first six months. The guy they team me with isn't a bad guy, but like everyone, there are always some things you don't like about other people. These things aren't horrible, but little things. Well, we were at a shipper one day at a slaughterhouse. The smell. I don't see how the employees manage it. We get hooked to our trailer, and I head in to get my paperwork. Leave only to find out, thankfully before I left that the seal number was different than what was on the papers. I go back in to correct this mistake, and as I walk in there is another trucker following me in. While I wait on my paperwork again, this guy and I strike up a conversation. In the middle of the convo, or rather towards the end, I happen to mention my mild frustrations about my partner. I want to paint a picture of this guy real quick. Six feet not fat, but has a bit of a trucker's pudge going on and around fifty years on him. His arms, I didn't really notice at first, had hundreds of small inch long cut scars, all different directions all over what I could see of his arms. He wore a short sleeved t-shirt. He also had some of these small scares on the neck around the collar of his shirt, but not so many. Bit of a wild look in his eye. Anyways, back to the story. In hearing my frustrations, this man proceeded to tell me that I have to let it go. I said, yeah, it really isn't that big a deal, so I don't think about it. Ah, guy, just let the demons out. He gestures a fist and drags it across his gut, as if he were holding a knife and cutting himself with it. Guy, you got to let the demons out and let them fall and walk away. Gesturing every word he is saying, the man then proceeded to pull his shirt up, and I now witnessed the same scaring from his arms on his stomach. All over. Hundreds. What got me the most was the really big one. Right in line with where he dragged his fist. I was in shock realizing the situation. This man has done this to himself, and is probably speaking literally. As my brain is racing, all I think is I need to be gone from here. So I nod my head in agreement, because I don't know what he would do if I didn't, and promptly ask for my paperwork with a staunch voice. Nothing came of it. But that man is seriously disturbed, and I think needs professional help. I hope he got it. It was the first and only time that I had ever genuinely feared for my life interacting with another individual on a face-to-face -face basis. I was staying at a cave hut in Wales on my own once, and had a pretty creepy experience. I stay at very remote cave huts a lot but never before on my own. This cave hut is huge. It used to be ten terraced miners cottages and has dozens of bunk rooms and common rooms downstairs. It's utterly remote and it doesn't have any curtains or blinds. So there's no way of telling if anyone is looking in the windows when it's dark. Not that that's very likely given the remoteness of the place, but I did get a shock when I saw the glowing eyes of some sheep looking in the kitchen window at me. There's no phone reception, no neighbors, and it's halfway up a Welsh mountain. There is a payphone in the conference room, but it's supposed to be for emergencies, cave rescue call-outs, etc., and I didn't even know how to turn it on. This place is so creepy that they used it as a set for one of the episodes of Torchwood. Countryside, the episode about the cannibalistic Welsh villagers. I'm a fairly rational person, but I was definitely getting myself a bit worked up once it went dark. The sheep incident particularly scared the bejesus out of me, but the bit of the hut I find spookiest, apart from the curtainless windows, is the bunk rooms upstairs. Because the hut was converted from ten cottages, there's no main hallway either upstairs or downstairs, and all the rooms connect in a rambly, circular sort of way. Most of the bunks are triple height, so there's pretty much no way to see all of a room at once, and the lights go off on a timer. I picked a bottom bunk in a room that had double width bunk beds and went to bed early. I'm woken up at about 2am by very loud banging coming from the radiator pipes 
which are right by my head. I initially panic, but convince myself that it's either the heating coming on, or else another group of cavers has arrived very late and are having showers or cooking. Due to the size of the place, there could well be another group that I hadn't heard arrive. So I go back to sleep. About an hour later, I am woken up again by more banging. But this time it's more like wood on wood, and it's coming from the ceiling. It's almost like someone wearing boots, stamping on the wood of the attic floor above me. This time I nearly shit myself. The only thing that stopped me leaving the room was the thought of all those spooky dark bunk rooms outside my room. Eventually it stopped, and somehow I went back to sleep. It's only when I woke up the next morning that I realized that there was no way the pipe noise could have been the heating, because it's never turned on. No other people have arrived overnight either, so that rules that out. That morning, a few local cavers come up to the hut, and I get talking to one of them about what I heard. He tells me that he had a similar experience in that room. He's a very superstitious person, and instantly accepted that it was a ghost or similar in the attic. I'm much more skeptical. So he decided to go up into the attic and investigate what was up there. Even though I'm a skeptic, what he said next sent shivers down my back. The attic room up above that room is not boarded, meaning that there's no way a ghost could have been stamping on the floor in the attic. So the only rational explanation, in his opinion, was that it was actually stamping, or banging, on the ceiling of the bunk room. The bunk room I was asleep in. I've never stayed at that hut alone again, and I've never slept in that particular bunk room. Edit. Sorry this turned into a bit of an essay. I'd forgotten just how scary this particular experience was.